I pledge allegiance to Yahweh Almighty, who has blessed the Constitutional Republic of the United States, and to that republic for which those gorgeous red, white, and blue stars and stripes stand, one nation under our only God, Yahweh, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yes, you heard that Pledge of Allegiance right. It's been changed before. In fact, if you do a little study on it, the phrase under God was never underneath, uh, was never, excuse me, included in the original. It was our President Eisenhower that included it. Uh, the children uh, in the public schools were forced to stand with their right hand raised in like a Hail Hitler type sign. And I guess that brought a little bit of conviction. And so our President Eisenhower introduced the under God added to our Pledge of Allegiance. However, let me toss this out to you. Do we pledge allegiance to a piece of cloth? Or do we pledge allegiance to our one and only Creator who gave us breath and appreciate Him for giving us this nation, this gorgeous nation for which those red, white, and blue stars and stripes stand? I want to put our Pledge of Allegiance in its proper perspective. We pledge allegiance to only one God with only one name and we find throughout all of Isaiah, Jeremiah, all the prophets, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they worshiped only one God and his name was Yahweh. Jehovah is a mistranslation that was introduced by a monk by the name of Peter Gallatin, sometimes known as Peter Galatinus. Then when we get to the New Blood Covenant, we know that that child, born of a virgin, was manifest, our God was manifest in flesh. Great is the mystery of godliness for God, whose God, Yahweh, was manifest in flesh. In fact, we find that Isaiah states very clearly that this child born of a virgin would not only have the attributes of counselor and wonderful, but he would have the attributes of mighty God and everlasting father. And there was only one with those attributes, and that was Yahweh. That child born of a virgin not, did not come just representing his father. He bore his father's name and was given his father's name, Yahweh, at birth. This is what Isaiah prophesies. Jeremiah says that the branch shall be called Yahweh our righteousness. Then you have the prophet Joel saying to call upon Yahweh in the last days. You have Zechariah chapter 14 uh, verses 1 through 9 state that Yahweh's feet is going to return to Mount Olives. The same one that ascended in the book of Acts is the same one that Zechariah prophesied whose feet would return to Mount Olives. Zechariah prophesied Yahweh's feet would return to Mount Olives. Therefore, we have received serious pagan errors in what we have in the King James Version. Now, this is very easily understood that if the enemy of our soul can remove the name of our God from his word and substitute it with titles, is it any wonder that he can just further deceive the world introducing pagan deities and saviors that were never intended for us to um, worship? That uppercase L-O-R-D, written in all uppercase letters, that uppercase G-O-D, written in all uppercase letters, that uppercase Adonai, written in all uppercase letters, that um, uppercase Hashem, written in all uppercase letters, replaced the name of Yahweh, yud heh wow -Hey. Yes, it did. Nearly 7,000 times. So that God, Yahweh, 
that we are supposed to be worshiping, not Jehovah. Jehovah, again, was a mistranslation introduced by a monk, Peter Gallatin, sometimes known as Peter Galatinus. It was Yahweh that was manifest in flesh, and his name has been removed from his word. And the purpose of this programming is to declare to the nations for the past 35 into 36 years now that his name has been removed from his word and substituted with titles. Who had the right to do that? Who? Therefore, our Pledge of Allegiance owes honor and allegiance to our one God, Yahweh, who has allowed us to live in this land of the free, which we've just, we are coming into this great awakening type uh, period for the last three years, finding out that we've really not been free. We've been made slaves by a corporation that has recently been debunked by our President Trump and our military alliance who works closely with him and our Vice President John F. Kennedy Jr. Now with this in mind, let's go back to our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to Yahweh Almighty. He's the one that gave us breath. He's the one that blessed us to live in this nation. And our flag simply represents this beautiful nation that has represented freedom until, until. So what does the word say? about a nation whose God is Yahweh. We find it in Psalm 33 and 12. From the complete Jewish Bible, it reads, How blessed is the nation whose God is, there's that uppercase Adonai. It should read Yahweh. So let's read it in its proper perspective. In fact, as I read to you, everywhere I see those uppercase titles, I will properly put back the name of Yahweh where it was removed. It should read, How blessed is the nation whose God is Yahweh, the people he chose as his heritage. KJV reads, Blessed is the nation whose God is Yahweh and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. Now, we know that the first chosen people were the 12 tribes of the 12 sons that represent the 12 tribes of Israel. We know that uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam split and 10 tribes went, were dispersed and two tribes remained in Israel. We know this. And then we find the nation of the United States, which was established the 13 colonies. And those 13 colonies represented freedom of religion to get away from England, the hierarchy of monarchy rule, to establish our freedom. And there were laws made in this nation. And one of those laws came from Jeremiah chapter 10 that stated, um, learn not the way of the heathen. And then it goes into talking about how a tree is cut out of the woods and decked with silver and gold. This was idolatry. And the second governor for the state of Massachusetts by the name of William Bradford, you can find this in the books, it's not hard to find. It was a law to against celebrating pagan Christmas. You could be fined and or put in jail for having a pagan Christmas tree. Yes, our 13 colonies were established on scriptural principle. Not what you think is scripture, not what I think is scripture, but what it actually says. In fact, going back to William Bradford, he is buried in one of the oldest cemeteries in the United States in Massachusetts, and he has a tombstone that states Yahweh is good in the Hebrew. You will find that yud Hey wah Hey on his tombstone. Yahweh is good. Of course, they say he was a Christian, but um, let me just toss another um, rock in your boat. <laughs> uh, that word Christian was never in the original. They were never called 
Christians at Antioch. Christian, Christ, Christos is all Latin that comes from Rome. Again, this nation was not established in the 13 colonies under Roman principle. No, we were established upon the Ten Commandments. It started out that way anyway. Oh, but the red coats kept coming. Not only the red coats, but uh, these evil entities that have ruled the world, the city of London, um, that's Vatican, uh, Vatican City, and then later on, the foreign entity of Washington, D.C. was established, and our nation's constitutional original rights were taken from us and placed underneath a corporation. All right, just a little bit of introductory to um, this program and who our God really is. But today I want to talk about something that's been laid in my spirit. And it's a word called modesty. This is not very a popular word because it's in the summertime. Let the nakedness begin. <laughs> oh, no. No, no. This was not the plan in the beginning. How long has this been taking place? When lib women's liberation took place and the women got out of the home and they started taking jobs instead of being the keeper at home that she should have been? There are many things that a woman can do within the home. Don't shut off that dial yet. Hear me out. This is word. This is word that's not taught. Why is it not taught? Oh, it's just not popular. I'm sure it's not. I'm sure it's not. Women have gotten out of their places what's happened. So what is modesty? This was the word that was laid in my spirit when I was praying earlier today. So I want to read from, uh, the, I'll be reading from the complete Jewish Bible and the King James Version about modesty and about a woman's place according to the scripture. Not according to what you think, not according to what I think, but what the scripture teaches. That men who are supposed to be preachers, teachers, teachers of prophets, apostles, and uh, evangelists, pro let's see, how does that go? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's it. A lot of them are not teaching. Why? Because women have gotten out of their place. All right, let's go to modesty. Reading from 1 Timothy 2 and 8. From the complete Jewish Bible, it says, Therefore, it is my wish that when men pray, no matter where, they should lift up hands that are holy, they should not become angry or get into arguments. Whoa. <laughs> this is 2 and 8. 2 and 9 from the complete Jewish Bible gets into where I'm headed. I speak to this um, nation as a woman. Likewise, the women, female gender, the women, when they pray, should be dressed modestly and sensibly in respectable attire, not with elaborate hairstyles and gold jewelry or pearls or expensive clothes. Wow. Wow. All right, let's stop and examine some of these words, all right? KJV reads, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. All right, let's, let's examine this word modest. The word modest means well-arranged, seemly, and then it speaks of modest again. All right, I ask you a question, ladies. What is modest about bending over and seeing mountains and valleys at both ends? What is modest about that? What is modest about wearing these 
Band-Aid bathing suits. What's modest about that? What is modest about appearing naked where you can see everything? What is modest about that? <laughs> I know you don't want to hear this, but have you ever checked out the, the uh, bathing suits that women wore and they did not mix bathe back in the 1800s? Oh my, they were fully covered, fully covered. Yeah, that's the way they bathed. So who introduced the nakedness, promiscuity, consciences that have been seared with a hot iron by lame stream lion media over a period of decades that has dumbed people down and seared their consciences with a hot iron. And who did they target? They targeted the weaker vessel. That would be the woman. The woman is considered, is called the weaker vessel in the scripture. Remember, Adam was created first, and then the woman was taken from the man. Remember, you may not want to hear that, but it's truth anyway. Who wants to believe something that's different from what they've heard? Huh, they don't teach it anymore. Why not? Is it because the money-grubbing preachers are after the money? <laughs> Think about that. Some people don't want to hear it because it doesn't suit their posh lifestyle. I never could understand why a man will want to show off his wife's nakedness and cause other men to, to lust after her. Now, from my perspective, as an aged woman, I'll soon be 68. As an aged woman, I blame the woman. Oh yeah, I do. By her demeanor and how she presents herself naturally and spiritually. Because if she was truly modest, she would be wearing appropriate clothing. Yes, she would. And she wouldn't be showing off her mountains and valleys. And she would save this for the privacy of her husband. Behind closed doors without perversion. What are you talking about perversion? Well, you know what homosexuals do. Man and wife don't do that. They don't. And that's as far as I'm going with that. Take it or leave it. It's truth anyway. Yahweh created the woman for the man, not the man for the woman. Remember, the woman was the afterthought, whether your ears like to hear this or not. It's truth. So let's go back to modesty. <laughs> modesty. So that word modest means well arranged, seemly, and modest. Okay, it says um, in 1 Timothy 2 and 9, it talks about uh, let them uh, let the that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Okay, well, what does apparel mean? Are you ready for this, ladies? Lowering, <laughs> letting down, letting down, L E T T I N G down, not raising up. Simple. There's nothing hard about that. A garment let down, dress. You hear that? A dress, attire. Did you know that women never wore men's apparel, pants, until Amelia Bloomer came along? Do you know who Amelia Bloomer is? You probably didn't, nobody's probably ever told you about it. We live in the, in 2022. Maybe no one's told you about old Amelia. Amelia Bloomer once wore long, loose dresses. And she got that arrogancy about her of rebellion. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as witchcraft and idolatry. This is word. What did she do? She cut off her long dress up to her knees or just above it with a pair of 
pantaloons or bloomers, that's what she named it after her name, underneath it, and she wore it as an outfit. And she says, well, I'm covered. But she had, she was showing men's pants is what she was doing. She was, look, those bloomers were made to be underwear, not to be flaunted and seen as an outfit. Yeah. Yeah. Truth. Truth. So apparel, again, 1 Timothy 2 and 9 says in your KJV, in like manner also that women, female gender, adorn themselves in modest apparel, well arranged, sensible garments, let down a dress. Well, if we got to wear dresses, those men need to go back to wearing robes. Well, I'm not here to teach the men. That's not my place. I'm speaking to the woman. The constitutional woman who claims she has integrity about the holy word of God. But she dresses like a harlot. You ever heard that saying? Oh, have you ever heard the saying, who wears the pants in your family? You ever heard that? You know where that came from? Because women never wore pants until Amelia Blumen came along. That's where that saying came from. Who wears the pants in your family? Who's boss? The woman or the man. Scripturally, the man has the last say-so in the house, whether he's right or wrong. <laughs> a true walk of faith if you're a woman full of the Holy Spirit of Yahweh, your husband gets the last word, right or wrong. And if you need a higher authority to overrule him, you can always go run and drop on your face in snot and tears and petition the Almighty. And I promise you, if you're living something, the Almighty Yahweh is going to hear and answer you, and he's going to deal with that man. He's going to deal with that man. I've watched it for years. I was married for 39 years before my husband was killed. And I've watched it. When I learned to zip my mouth, I was so glad my husband had a harder head than me. <laughs> so thankful. Yeah. <laughs> when I learned, and I learned, it was hard. I was young and dumb. I didn't know a lot of stuff. But the Holy Spirit taught me. And I got plenty of practice. But when I learned to zip my spirit first, my big fat mouth wouldn't open up. And then I would watch Yahweh work for me. And this is the secret in the Holy Spirit that keeps husbands and wives together when everyone gets in their place. And the woman is to be the keeper at home. Keeper at at home. It's back years ago when she got out of the home. Children, children were tossed to whoever to take care of them. And that's when homes became disrupted. Well, I've got to work. I've got to do this, 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 and this, and this. Well, there's lots you can do at home and keep your children. I have to say something. My mom was not a true believer full of the Holy Spirit. She was aware of God and our God used her at different times, but she wasn't one to sell out to completely obey things. But I have to say she set a very good example that she stayed at home with us as children and never left us. I can remember when I was very young. She got a job at home typing envelopes. And she would type them by the hundreds. That, that woman could probably type as fast as she could think. And she did that while we were children. And she made extra money doing that. That was way back in the day. And she never took a job until we were in school. And she made sure that she was home when we got home from school or within an hour after we got in from school. My mom was dedicated to her children. But where's mom now? Who are you leaving your children with? Do you even know? 
You know, there's families I've heard of for years, nightmare stories, where mom has left her children with family members who have been complete perverted devils and violated their children, violated them sexually, abusively. And whose fault is that? Because mom wanted to take a job and the money was more important than rearing your children in the fear and admonition, and admonition of the almighty Yahweh? It's time to repent, lovely American. I don't even know if America is part of the Republic of the Constitution yet. I think that might have been dismissed. I have to relook at that. But you women who live in a constitutional republic of the United States, who claim to be believers, it's time to wake up. You see what's happening all around us. You see how people's minds have been thwarted. People's minds have been just perverted. And it didn't come overnight. It took years and years and 16 years of wicked presidencies. And even before then, because mom got out of her place and took a job and the children were strewn to whoever or whatever because mom thought more of the mighty dollar than raising her children, training them up in the way that they should go so that when they are old, they'll not depart. We're talking about modesty. We're talking about a woman's place. Look, we've all been young and dumb. We've all done stupid things. But when we get older and we come to the realization, if you've got the real Holy Spirit, there's going to be something within you that's going to resonate with the things that I share with you. Yes. Yes. It's time to pray. It's time to develop your relationship with Yahweh in a deeper measure. It's not just an outward adornment. It's that inward modesty that's going to make the outward manifest. I've watched over the years, prominent women, look, you can have elegant appearance and be modest. Elegant, beautiful women and be modest and not show your, <laughs> your mountains and valleys on either end. Save that for the privacy of your home with your husband by yourself, without perversion. Think about it, ladies. This is so important, so very important. This is not to um, browbeat anybody. Look, we all have things that we face. We're talking about modesty, modesty of the heart within that manifests itself on the outside. Well, you're judging me. Well, does the word say that we know a tree by its fruit? We, we can identify trees by their bark. We can, and that's an outward appearance. We can identify a tree by its leaves. And we identify the tree by the fruit it bears. Either the fruit is good fruit or the fruit is bad fruit. And if it represents immodesty, no taste. You can be tastefully elegant without being revealing. Tastefully elegant without being revealing. It's your fault if men look at you to lust after you. Because the word says that for a man to look upon a woman to lust, it's as if he's committed the act in his heart already. And that will judge that man for as transgression, sin. Oh yeah. The new blood covenant is harder. It's the thought of foolishness that's sin. It's the thought. We got to cast those thoughts down. How do you cast down a thought when you got a naked woman standing in front of you? Come on, women. Don't play stupid. Wake up. We got to wake up to a lot of things. Number one, who is our God? And who had the right to remove his name from his word? And search this out. 
and then become that modest woman that Almighty Yahweh expects of us. Until another time, we'll take up with modesty part two on the next program. Shalom.